It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness. This sense of always looking at one's self through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. W.E.B. Du Bois, Strivings of the Negro People, as posted in The Atlantic in 1897. Welcome to Point Black. Everyone, thank you so much for sticking with us for episode two of Point Black. We hope you enjoyed getting to know us last week as much as we enjoyed sharing with you. If you're new here, we appreciate you taking the time to connect. And if you've been with us since inception, thank you so much for sticking around. My name is Tashika O'Shea, and with me is my co host and friend, Camelia Guthrie. So last week, we started off on Easy Street with a little bit of a chit-chat between Cam and I about who we are and 21 random questions that allowed us to reflect, to make connections and charge new paths and perspectives. This week is a little bit different. We turn our attention to the concept of double consciousness as coined by W.E.B. Du Bois in describing the experience of being Black in America. We wanted to explore this phenomenon in the contemporary Canadian context and more specifically in the context of identifying both as Black and a woman. Joining us for our discussion is Desmond Cole and of his many hats, he is an activist in the fight against systemic racial injustice. My co-host had the pleasure of connecting with Desmond for an interview this week and it was a really good one. This is part one of a three-part interview on double consciousness. This week, we focus on breaking down the concept of double consciousness for you, our listeners, before looking at the collective struggle of Black people in Canada. So, some key points coming out of the interview include the narrative of the Canadian dream and what it is outside of Canada, the fact that the Black experience isn't confined to a specific kind of Black person, and how blacks have the tendency to adopt white societal standards and then pass judgment on each other. The interview also explored the cornerstone of white culture, which Desmond describes as being built on theft, colonization, land appropriation, and exploitation. The fleetingness of white memory and its ability to reset itself to dismiss activities around racism choosing instead to adopt the myth of exceptionalism. The need of Blacks to collectively organize for racial justice instead of depending on a system that thrives on their injustices. And the fact that Black people adapt to double consciousness as a means of survival. Let's take a listen. Desmond Cole is an award-winning journalist, a radio host, and a leading Black activist and critic of systemic racial injustice, as Tash pointed out earlier. His writing has appeared in the Toronto Star, Toronto Life, The Walrus, Now Magazine, Ethnic Isle, Torontoist, BuzzFeed, and The Ottawa Citizen. He is also the author of The Skin We Are In, that Pop Matters has described as a masterpiece. The Skin We Are In was published earlier this year. Welcome, Desmond. Thank you for being here. Hi, Camelia. Hi, Tashika. So first of all, I just read a bio, but I'm sure there's so much more to who Desmond is. I am 38 years old. I was born in Red Deer, Alberta, to two West African immigrant parents. Mm -hmm. My parents are from Sierra Leone. Both of them were born in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and uh, they met there. They married and then eventually moved to Canada, to Alberta, and they settled in 
what was a pretty small place at that time called Red Deer, Alberta. And um, that's where my older sister and I were born. And I lived there for about five years before coming to Ontario and the GTA. So I grew up in Oshawa. Um, I went to a French immersion school uh, all throughout elementary and high school. Mm -hmm. Both of my parents are nurses. My mom is a nurse at a nursing home. And my father is a retired mental health nurse. Um, I really wish I read more than I do, but I'm very interested in ideas around blackness, obviously. Right. Um, ideas about our identity, particularly as black people, from coming from so many different parts of the world and being part of what's known as Canadian society. I'm interested in our relationship to this land given that it is not our land and this is a stolen indigenous territory mm -hmm. or set of indigenous territories. And um, when I'm not thinking about all of these things, I like to watch birds in my backyard. Oh, wow. That must be so peaceful. It's the most wonderful thing, the sounds. And I need to get a better camera so that I can actually take better pictures. But that is something that gives me a lot of Joy. Awesome. So what sparked your love for activism? Um, I think activism is, is about love for sure. So I like that you put it that way, but it's also about need. Mm -hmm. And I believe that I started getting involved in activism because of my own personal need to do so and a recognition of the needs of people around me. Right. So I told you that I grew up in Oshawa and I went to school and I did pretty well in school, academically anyway. And I went to Queen's University with a lot of expectations of my family and probably of people who knew me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't last at Queen's. I only finished two years. And I mean, I, I wasn't much of a student at Queen's University, I have to say. And I ended up moving to Toronto shortly after I dropped out of school. And this was really where life kind of caught up to me. Right. Right. And that all of the expectations that we're led to have as young children, all of these ideas about what kind of future we can have because we're smart or because we did well in school, um, that, that can happen for some of us sometimes, but what I found was as a recently dropped out of school, 21 year old black person who wanted to work, but didn't have any education past high school. Mm -hmm. I found like there weren't that many options for me. And this was shocking and hard. And when I moved to Toronto, I couldn't get housing. I actually ended up, spending some time in the shelter system in Toronto. Okay. And this is where I started to say, like, I have to fight for myself. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I think I was very liberal minded. I know I was very liberal minded. And I believed in this idea of Canada. I believed in the Canada that my parents had told me was a place where you can have opportunity if you get an education and if you work hard. Mm -hmm. And the older that I got, um, the more that I realized that, like, no, finding a job is not easy, no matter how educated you right. are, or finding um, a place to live. And that, and that all of these things are also tied to the fact that I'm a Black person mm -hmm. and I'm a Black man. This is when I started seeing the need for activism, when I had to apply for social assistance and realize that the money doesn't even pay your rent. Mm. This is when I had to start thinking about activism when the shelter system that you stay in is crowded all the time and people are mistreated there, people are beat up, there isn't enough um, services for people. This is where you start to be like, oh my gosh, like something has to be done. Right. And I started to learn the power through community organizing, through community organizations and 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 drop-in centers and harm reduction workers who reached out to a young 
person like myself and like supported me, I started to learn the value of people organizing together, of people um, speaking with one voice, but collectively acting. Mm -hmm. And I think what really started to inspire me, and that was about 15 years ago. So in many ways, the last 15 years of my life have been a kind of self, um, self exploration and like self, uh, revelation to find out that this is what I wanted to do, that I wanted to fight back, that I wanted to challenge these systems, and that I wanted to do that with other people who were like-minded. So I'm, I'm, I'm about 15 years into that struggle, I guess you could say, a little more than 15. Okay, and all of that has come together in The Skin We're In, which is your book that you published just this year. Can you tell us about The Skin We're In? Yes. Uh, thankfully, that book is not is not autobiographical as such. So <laughs> I don't get into a whole long business about even as much as I've told you now. Right. That that book is a book about the collective struggle that Black people, specifically in Canada, are facing, mm -hmm. and a little bit of an attempt by me to connect what we are facing today to the history of Black. Um, struggle in Canada. What I decided to do was, you know, I'm a journalist and I find that when we write for mainstream publications, there's so little room and time to contextualize our lives and our circumstances mm -hmm. and our, our culture mm -hmm. as Black people. It's just like Black person gets shot, Black person gets kicked out of school, you yeah. know, Black person... Um, Being aggressive. speaks when they're not supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this just constant, um, you know, Black person alleges racism because even in the 21st century, Canada wants to pretend that we don't know huh, what kind of a world and a country we're dealing mm -hmm. with. So I find that to be a very unsatisfactory way to speak about ourselves as Black people and to explore what we're going through. And uh, luckily, I wrote this piece in 2015 called The Skin I'm In, which was actually autobiographical and did talk about my own experiences of, you know, going to school in Kingston, as I mentioned, and being racially profiled by the police there. I remember that. Um, Please, yeah. and, and facing discrimination when I came to Toronto after believing that Toronto was that multicultural mecca that everybody says that it is and that there isn't racism here. I believed all that when I moved here. And then very shortly afterwards, I had to, I had to drop that fantasy. And so I wrote this piece about my own experiences in 2015. And that led to a book deal, which I wanted to kind of point in a different direction. Mm -hmm. I wanted to Canada more broadly and black people in Canada more broadly. So I picked one year, the year 2017. Mm -hmm. And I made a book about that year in black struggle. Each chapter of the book represents a month of the year 2017. And what I'm doing is telling different stories about black struggle in arts, in the education system, mm -hmm. uh, the police, uh, black people fighting for cultural recognition and the ability to celebrate culturally queer and trans black people being particularly like just leaders right. in fighting to celebrate who they are and who we are as black people and making a more inclusive idea of blackness visible. I talk about immigration, mm -hmm. right? I talk about even some of the struggles that we have within the black community in Canada about whether the government is going to save us all and whether the government is our friend mm -hmm. and really ask governments to, you know, sit nicely at the table with us, as they like to say, or whether we have to flip the table. Oh, so each chapter of the book examines one of these ideas or one of these themes and includes real reporting of stories that I have been following in my journalism career over the last many years. That's awesomeness. Where can people find your book? And are you planning a follow-up? <laughs> <laughs> so the Skin We're In came out in late January of 2020. And so I very much still feel like this book is in its infancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably have a, another book or two in me, though. Okay. I can't lie. Okay. People can find the book 
literally by Googling the Skid Row. Right. And they can either Google that with my name or with Double Day Books, and they will find it quite easily. It's available in hardcover, uh, ebook, audiobook, in which I actually read the book uh, back to our listeners. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's out there in the world for people to buy and enjoy. We're going to start a book club on here where we recommend books. So I'll definitely be giving it a read and um, passing it on to our listeners. I appreciate that. No problem. So now we're going to switch gears going into double consciousness. And double consciousness, as I understand it, is a feeling as though your identity is divided into several parts, um, making it difficult or impossible to have one unified identity. Would you agree with this? And can you elaborate further for those who have never heard of the term? Sure. I actually talked a little bit about double consciousness in that personal essay I wrote in 2015. And to me, what it means is, you know, this is a term that was coined by W.E.B. Du Bois, Mm -hmm. who was, you know, writing and thinking and fighting for Black life just over a century ago was when he would have written about double consciousness for the first time. So late... uh, 1800s, early 1900s. And what I understand him to mean when he talks about double consciousness in America is that Black people have a reality where they have their own identity and understanding of who they are as human beings. Mm -hmm. But because of the legacy of slavery in America, um, because of Jim Crow segregation, which was in full force during Du Bois's life, you know, so they liberated, so-called liberated Black enslaved people, but then immediately created a system of new carceral punishments against Black people and new social divisions so that Black people couldn't participate in American social life, right? Right. So um, what, what, what I understand Du Bois to be saying is because of that legacy, because of that history in America, a Black person can't just understand themselves through their own eyes and through their own understanding. They also really, I think primarily as a means of safety, have to understand how they appear to white people in the white majority in their society and the white, the white power structure in their society. A black person, in other words, um, can't afford not to know how white people see them. Black people have to be constantly aware of how they are being seen, othered, Mm -hmm. feared, pitied by white society. Mm -hmm. That ability to understand that may be very painful. And yes, it's a notion of almost like a split identity, which I want to come back to. Mm -hmm. But for me, this is primarily a mechanism of safety and self-preservation because if you're not aware uh you know i talk about my own growing up and thinking that canada was this certain place the boys might have been talking about america in the 1800s 1900s but i think his his commentary applies so broadly to black people on stolen and colonized lands Mm -hmm. um as a black young man i didn't think that my race mattered i didn't want to believe that it mattered when my parents told me as a child that i had to work harder than all the white kids at my school i went to a mostly white school in a mostly white town and when my parents told me that you have to work harder just to get as much as these other students do well i didn't want to hear that i wanted to drink the canadian kool-aid that told me that everybody's equal and that everybody will actually be treated equally um of course, the older that I got, the more that I recognized that that wasn't the case. And, and, and that's just the thing is that when you're a 19 or 20 year old black person walking down the street at night in Toronto, as I was, uh, or walking through the streets of Kingston, Ontario, as a student, you kind of have to be aware that the police might be seeing you in a specific way, even though you're not doing anything different from anybody else. When you want to go and do a job interview, you have to be aware of the different way 
that people are looking at you, white people, and the white gaze, which informs all of our institutions, a, a white gaze that even uh, black people can adopt. Mm -hmm. We can critique and judge ourselves by the standard of whiteness. I think that's really the heart of what double consciousness means for me is like this understanding that because of power, right? Because power is a real thing, um, it matters that this white dominated society can look at us and can judge us and can other us. And we have to be aware at all times that that's happening in order to just basically protect ourselves, keep ourselves safe, but also to understand the culture that we're living in. And I think it's important that when he talks about double consciousness, Du Bois also talks about a veil. That was my double next question. Like, how would right. you describe the veil of double consciousness? So I think this is critical because, again, this is my inter understanding or interpretation. A veil can serve many functions, but I think that the biggest function that this veil that comes with double consciousness serves is that it means that white people cannot understand our reality and our day-to-day -day without like deep, deep, deep reflection and study and listening. Mm -hmm. But their world of whiteness in these white dominated stolen territories that we live on their world is just normal to us. We know everything about white culture. Right. White people don't think there's such thing as white culture, and they'll tell you, oh, I don't really have a cultural tradition. You know, we're kind of boring and white. That's, that's the biggest lie in the world. I mean, white supremacy is a global phenomenon. It's not just the absence of culture. Mm -hmm. You white people standing here in Canada with land and money and the indigenous populations that lived here for thousands of years have no clean drinking water in some First Nations areas. Yep. Why is that? It's because your culture was literally to come and take everything away from them because your culture was to come to Sierra Leone and to take that away from West African people and all up the West Coast of Africa looking for gold and diamonds. That's white culture. And I know that that feels hurtful to people maybe sometimes to hear that. Right that we're allowed to have a black culture that we're allowed to celebrate and be proud of and that white people have to be ashamed of what we call white culture or white supremacy. But that's history. That's the last 400 years on this planet that have led to, um, you know, the crimes against black people, mm -hmm. the crimes against indigenous people that are ongoing to this day all over the world. So, but how, um, how do you argue with a white person who will say, oh, that was our forefathers and not us? I tried not to argue with mm. white people. It's bad for my health. But <laughs> <laughs> if I have to have those conversations, I would say um, if you don't, for example, believe in history, then you should not take an inheritance. So when your forefathers made all that money, off of my ancestors' backs, you should give that money back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you don't believe in history, then don't benefit from it. Mm. That's actually quite simple. But instead, what we have is we have a society where white history is supreme and where we have to have monuments and statues to all of the people that were, uh, you know, the racism of today is very, well, veiled, right. isn't it? Right, right. Um, doesn't come at you in your face. And yet we are supposed to honor people like John A. MacDonald, the first prime minister of this country, mm -hmm. who was, I mean, he was a proud white supremacist. He proudly said that the white race and culture was superior and that it was through the dominion of God, which granted this superiority to white people, that he and his kind were allowed to come from Britain to the Americas and take whatever they wanted, kill anybody who got in their way, enslave some indigenous people, kick most of them off of their territory, create an Indian act that still exists to this mm. day. So if people want to forget the legacy of Johnny McDonald, why is there an Indian act? Mm. I mean, this, this is the problem with that argument. But let me not lose the, the veil part of this. I, right. I think 
important to reflect on the fact that although, for example, my parents were not born in this country, in order to survive in Canada as immigrants, they had to learn all the norms of this society and, quite frankly, they had to learn their place yeah. as Black people. Mm -hmm. and, and that their son, despite the fact that I am born in this country and I was born a Canadian citizen and know no other land, I too have to be completely aware and conscious of this white dominated society, this white supremacist culture, and how it wants to always regulate me and keep me in line. But white folks ask those questions like, oh, well, why should I pay for the crimes of my forefathers? Because they don't understand anything about us. Mm -hmm. While we are so versed, in our own culture and the way that it sees us, white people have the luxury of never having to think about how we live, how we struggle, how we survive, how we die. Um, so that veil is a very interesting feature of our awareness because we are hyper-conscious of whiteness. But mm -hmm. Whiteness don't know a damn thing about black people. You mentioned before that the, even though Dubois had mentioned it in the American experience, you, you touched on the Canadian experience, but can you touch a little more on what that looks like in Canada and what constitutes that I identity? I mean, there's no lack of examples, is there? Um, the one that I think maybe is the easiest in terms of like public awareness, but which, by the way, we have already tried to erase from our memory is the fact that... Uh, all these photos of Justin Trudeau in blackface surfaced recently. Mm -hmm. Now that was like six months ago. Right. I would say our country has fairly decided that that's over. I mean, they decided it was over nearly as soon as it, they found out about it. And, and that's fascinating to me, right? Because nobody would be surprised if any member of the United States Congress or their disgusting president or any kind of like powerful U.S. white male figure none of us would be surprised to know that they did blackface back in the day and were proud of it and thought it was funny and thought it was just a harmless joke we always pretend though mm -hmm. that that would not happen in canada that we're somehow different and trudeau's disc um the exposure of those all those different multiple times of trudeau using you know what looked like shoe polish basically mm -hmm to cover his face, to sometimes cover his arms and legs, and to go out in public and take pictures of himself, take videos with people. This, like, rehearsed behavior of his, which he seems to really enjoy, it's so um, contrary to the myth of Canadian exceptionalism that we don't act like that, that we're not the Americans. And yet, what happened as soon as everybody saw those pictures in Canada? All the excuses that we have heard south of the border from public figures who get caught up in this, they were just so quick to people's lips here. Right. They were so quick to find all of these excuses about how it was a long time ago. I mean, that's one of the favorite white moves to innocence, right, is that it was a long time ago. So we can't be responsible for something. And a long time ago can be 100 years ago. Or in Justin Trudeau's case, it can be 15 years ago when he was a grown-ass man teaching at a private school. Or it could be minutes ago. You know, like white uh, memory can really erase like, and reset itself really quickly when it comes to the inconveniences of what they do to hurt Black people. Yeah, so, you know, for me to pretend... But that's, that's like a high-level example. Right. The kind of... I try to get into in my book are like, how is the average black person doing in Canada today in terms of their employment and their ability to like keep a roof over their head? How is the average black person doing in terms of the education system? Mm -hmm. um, black people are in jail in Canada. If we're such a different country than that other country, why are there so many black people in jail? And you know, the racist reflexive response 
which I know too well because of my double consciousness, Mm -hmm. is that it's always our fault in the end. And we're always being too sensitive and we need to get over it and we need to fix ourselves and then we need to fix our own communities. But that, what I see in Canada, the social and economic disadvantage of Black people in pretty much every facet of life, that's white supremacy, that's anti-Blackness, that's systemic institutional racism we have that in canada because we live in a white supremacist world and we like to pretend that there's some kind of shield or maybe a wall we didn't like trump's wall too much but i think we believe that there's a wall in front of canada that protects us from all of these evil influences from the outside we are no different this is a country stolen from indigenous people by white colonists and imperialists Mm -hmm. and we share the legacy of all other places in the world where that has happened up to today they don't go away with time they don't go away with nice thoughts and feelings and they certainly don't go away with a liberal prime minister who pretends to love and care about black people but then couldn't even find an apology for his years of dressing up as us as if we are not even human you know, like the fact that Trudeau got off so easy and that actually so many people were demanding that it's black people who need to shut up now and get over it, that, that just tells me everything I need to know about my country. Wow. Okay, so you mentioned that society puts this pressure on us to be always conscious of who we are, but also of the people we, we, um, we associate with on a day-to-day basis. But is there any part of double consciousness that is personal? Well, I think it goes from the, the public and the social, and it filters into the personal, right? Mm-hmm. And so on the personal, you might decide um, to straighten your hair as a Black person because you have concluded that you will have more respect, you will get better opportunities, you will be treated with more dignity, um, than if you leave your hair kinky or wear a fro. As you like, mentioned that, that, not to cut you, as you mentioned that, I was telling to she, because I think what two weeks ago, that my hair is natural, has been natural for years. But every time since I got to Toronto, every time that I go for a job interview, I will straighten my hair. And she was like, why? And I'm like, it's because of the idea and the consciousness of the fact that they will judge you. Because there tends to be this idea that if you're if your hair is natural or you do certain things, then you're blacker than black. And they don't want mm-hmm. that in their space. And I'm like, in order to get a seat at the table, I'll straighten my hair. And she's like, oh, maybe you need to work on that. And it's probably true. So it's funny that you just mentioned that. Well, I, I mean, this is, this is what I hear listening and talking with black people every day of my life. And this is what I've seen in my own family. And this is like, this is, this is our lives. Like, this is what, we experience. And so when I talk about survival, the ability to get a job for which then you can support yourself Mm -hmm. and maybe get other opportunities in life, that's about your survival. And not knowing the way that white people look at your hair, just your hair as a Black person, can make the difference between a lot of different social and economic opportunities. Absolutely. And then we have the challenge, right? Because if we go too hyper personal and we say, well, I straightened my hair and I got the job. So you should straighten your hair if you want the job too. And if you as a black person don't choose to conform to all these ways that white people are looking at us, then it's actually your fault (laughs) for not using that knowledge to your advantage. This is where I get, scared about making it too personal because a black person needs to be able to wear their hair however the damn well they please without having to lose out on economic opportunity having to lose out on social opportunities having to be criticized or shamed we need to get to a world where that doesn't happen to black people anymore and although we may conform in some circumstances and i conform and i understand it at a personal level we do that to survive, we also have to fight for a world where Black people do not have to do that anymore. And I think it's really important when we think about history 
to recognize that there is no, you know, Dr. King said, um, the moral arc of history is long, but it bends toward freedom, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I love that quote, but I think it's incomplete. Mm. Um, it, does, it doesn't naturally bend towards freedom. It's the struggle yeah, you have to that force people it. like Dr. King himself engaged in. That's what bends the moral arc of history. It doesn't bend on its own. And we should be very careful in a place like Canada not to believe that if we just keep following the rules, that one day everything for Black people is going to be fine. History does not demonstrate that, and it's not real. So we do actually have to fight, even as we make personal choices and sacrifices sometimes, in order to survive in a white supremacist world. And with that, we wrap up part one of our three-part conversation on double consciousness. And of course, our guest for today was Desmond Cole. He's a journalist and also an activist in the fight against racial injustice. Thank you for listening. Next week, we turn our attention to double consciousness and its relationship to black youth and women. Join us on a Friday at 11 a.m. on your favorite podcast platforms.